It's 8.05. We're wide awake on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the voice of Detroit. We're streaming live on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation.com. Download our app. Play it across all Apple platforms, all Windows platforms, all Android platforms. The answer is on Amazon, Kindle Fire, Roku, Google Chromecast, Google Chromecast, and YouTube Red. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And comment on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Let us know what you think. That helps us out. That makes us better. The number one thing you can do is make us your number one preset in your car. Go ahead. Lock us in right now. Unleash that 50,000 watts of attitude every day. We are 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the voice of Detroit. Right now, last week, we talked about gentrification. We have an election coming up this summer uh, for mayor, city clerk, which we'll talk about next week, and city council. And one of the bigger issues, one of the bigger issues that we're going to be faced with and those candidates that are running, the incumbents that are going to running, the people that are going to be challenging them, one of the biggest issues is gentrification. I have on the line Jason, Jason Black from the movie Gentrification, right? Gentrified, ethnic cleansing, Gen- American style. See that? Gentrified, ethnic cleansing, American style. You actually put up a billboard. Welcome, Mr. Black. Glad to be here, sir. That billboard was crazy. That you billboard. Know, I thought it was the same, but yeah, uh, it got a lot of people's attention. Yeah. I chose that area strategically. Um, I'm from Louisiana, but I did my research and I chose that area strategically because that area at Eight Mile, for those of you who live there, is actually significant to you because it's a boundary. And that was the reason why I had that billboard put there in particular. We have your trailer queued up. Would you mind if we played that trailer so people can get the context and the Absolutely. power of your moving? Uh, All right. Yeah. All right. You all, ladies and gentlemen, check out the trailer for this amazing movie that's going to be coming out. And you can see it February 18th at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Listen to this. What if the richest people on earth had a plan to remove the poorest people? What we're seeing is a class and racial remake of the city to the extent that we haven't before. People are coming back to the core of the cities. Who lives in the core of the cities? Black people. Manhattan of the future will be a place that will be reserved primarily for people who are rich. What if everyone had their own economy except you? So they fix up the urban neighborhoods, not for the residents, they fix them up so that the the white newcomers to our city will have a place to live and the black community is left with welfare. Black community is under duress all the time. But there is no memo, no smoking gun, no backroom plan that says, who can we do in today? I know. The only time resources are used to develop these communities when there are long-term plans in place to remove the people from those communities, to force migrations, to force evictions, and to price the people out. What if the local police chief is also the local Grand Dragon. There are instruments to help remove us on a local, state, and on a federal level. In a continent-spanning event, Black Channel Films presents the first comprehensive examination of gentrification and how it affects Black people. We take you across the country from Chocolate City to the Motor City. From the Empire State all the way to the Golden State. Some people still think they can bury their heads in the sand, but there's nowhere to hide from the forces of ethnic cleansing, American style. And like it or not, one way or the other, Very soon, 
there might not be a black majority to keep people in office. If that happens, then would Lord help us all? Mr. Black, that ending was serious. The ending of that trailer was very serious, especially and it rings home to Detroit uh, because we no longer have a black mayor after so many years here. But is that the death knell for Detroit? Explain it. Well, I'm in my first film, 7 a.m., I had talked about Detroit in particular because it was very clear the writing was on the wall about this. The problem that you're experiencing, and we as black people, period, because this is Detroit is in, not an outlier. Detroit is actually the epitome of the grand scheme of gentrification nationwide. But the real problem is that this is the effect of not building your own economy. You're talking right now in Detroit about Dan Gilbert and Mike Ilyich and these people who are not even from Detroit, but they're coming in, buying up everything they can and whatnot. And there's only one question that you need to ask yourself. With anything new that is being built, with any economic so-called development being built, there's only one question that matters. Is this being done for the people who currently are standing there, or is this being done for someone else? And if it's being done for someone else, exactly who are they? Now, I've had some people in Detroit who have actually argued that they're not being gentrified. Black people are not being removed from the city and whatnot. I wanted to ask you one question. Maybe you can help get me up to speed onto something. Maybe I'm mistaken about a few things. Um, how many games are going to be played at Joe Louis Arena where the Red Wings play at this year? How many games are going to be played there? Uh, isn't that 76 games? Okay. Yeah, about and 76. How, and how many games are scheduled to be played next year? Well, they're going to be a lot more because the Pistons are moving downtown, so they're going to be a ton of them at our new at our new arena. Okay. Oh, at the new arena. It's a okay. brand new arena in downtown Detroit. Oh uh, yeah, the new arena. Right. Okay. And but, then the question becomes: So, what's going to happen to Joe Lewis Arena? Mister Black, um, one of our callers just called in, didn't want to be embarrassed on the air, and they want you to give a good, concrete explanation of exactly what gentrification is. Um, that's the thing I'm asking you about right now. All I need is the answer to that next question. What's going to happen to Joe Lewis Arena? Uh, well, actually, during our bankruptcy, uh, it was pledged to, I, I hope I hope I've got this company right, Sincora Guarantee Trust, one of the uh, bondholders from the failed um, from the failed credit default swap, swap pension deal under Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, which was spearheaded by my good friend, Sean Wardlow, we remember you, Sean. You thought I forgot what you did to our city. Sorry, go ahead. And basically, like I said, there were reports that it was going to be demolished. They're moving the Red Wings to a new stadium. That's right. And that's all great and wonderful. And Joe Louis Arena is now questionable. Now, that's a nationwide landmark, Joe Louis Arena. Everybody everywhere knows about Joe Louis Arena. I don't think the new stadium is going to be named Joe Louis Arena. No, it's going I to be the P- it's it's a Little Caesars Pizza Arena. Right. I actually have a picture of Pizza Pizza guy on the top. Pizza, and pizza. that, sir, after all the work that was done to get Joe Louis Arena and take a look at how this is going, that is ethnic cleansing, American style. Hmm. If you want a concrete example, that's what it looks like. Oh, you, whether the building is torn down or not, you can keep it but all the real action will be going on somewhere else. Interesting percep- yeah. perception. Yeah, perspective. So you're saying it's ethnic cleansing because the, the, the constant repeating of the name Joe Louis Arena will no longer be repeated because all the games are no longer there. That's I want interesting. people to understand that gentrification is not simply about real estate. That is only one aspect of it. It's the most concrete example. It's the most historically cited example. But what I want to introduce you to is the idea that gentrification is about more than just an influx of people of higher income levels coming into your area. Gentrification is about your government. It is about your schools. It is about physical as well as social and ideological boundaries. That is what it really is about because if we can remove you from all these other things, guess what? You're not there anymore. Another mm-hmm. idea I want to introduce you to is that if you do not control the economic real estate of where you are, you can totally forget about controlling the physical real estate. When you're talking about Mike Duggan, 
the lady who called earlier was mentioning about, well, the snow plows haven't been running on time. They haven't been doing the, clearing the streets like they were supposed to. And you notice the change happening here. Well, what has been Mike Duggan's priority since he got in office? His priority has been economic development, getting big businesses to come invest big money because we got a big debt to take care of, not clearing the streets. So I'm telling you, you don't control the economic real estate. Outsiders come in, and I'm just wondering to myself here, that new stadium that's being built, is that being built for the average black person in Detroit, or is that being built to be an amenity comfortable to someone who doesn't really constitute that 80% of the population of Detroit right now? Hmm. Okay. Well, at, at the prices there are going to be awfully high. Uh, they're going to be awfully high, but they're building a neighborhood that's supposed to, they're building new neighborhoods around it that are supposed to have a mix of incomes and all that. At least that's in their proposal. And uh, we always hear that everywhere we are. And amazingly enough, it always, when there's new construction, it always turns out going to the highest bidder. If not, if not from the very outset, eventually it winds up getting there. And it's not just there. Also, in Atlanta, we got stadiums going up. You're witnessing the same thing. It used to be that they used freeways to plow through black neighborhoods or gentrify them. Now they're using hospitals, schools, and sports stadiums to mm. do the same thing now. So just mark my words. Yeah, take a picture of those housing prices while you still can. If they're nice, they won't stay that way very long. Okay, we've got a caller on the line. Who is it, Ramonte? Jackson. Jackson, you're on. Hello, how you doing? All right, go ahead with your question or comment. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, I don't think it should be so much protest with, uh, you know, the new president. You know, he got elected because he got a lot of love from people. So um, if it was a fake fake election, then thank you, show, was... Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Some people aren't right on time. Continue, uh, Mr. Black. The other thing I wanted people to understand is that gentrification also comes from a government level. I filmed extensively in Detroit. I went down to Gross Point so that people can see Kershaw and see exactly the ominous overtones that the changing of the traffic flow in that area represents. I also went down to Flint, Michigan, where most people don't know that you can go up whole blocks where people have whole pallets of drinking water sitting on their front porches today, not two years ago, right now while I'm talking to you, while the state government is saying the water is fine and perfectly okay to drink for the most part. I guess if you don't mind risking a little lead poisoning, it's perfectly fine to drink. Oh, yeah, and one more thing, the population of Flint, has been going down and has accelerated since this mess with the water has started. Now, what I'm telling you right now is I have a sneaking suspicion, and I could be wrong, but I have a sneaking suspicion that as soon as some more damage is done to that population, that all of a sudden the state's going to stop fighting about whether or not all the piping needs to be replaced, all the stonewalling is going to go away, and they're going to figure out how to get enough money to just replace everything quick, fast, and in a hurry soon as those demographics change a little bit more. I just have a sneaking suspicion that's going to happen. Okay, we have Omar on the line. Omar, go ahead. Omar. Hey, what's up, my brother, Jason Black? How you doing, brother? Black first, brother. What's on your mind? Good. Uh, Steve Hunt, hey, hey, ain't you cashing in on gentrification, too? Don't you got a little commercial telling people uh, uh, cash for your home, get your, get your cash in the, in, in the week? That's, that's that's the uh, engine of gentrification right there, if you need an example. I All just people are allowed that, to advertise. Thank you. I'm an equal opportunity advertiser. And, and don't worry about me. Don't worry about me cashing in on gentrification. I'm just giving you an example, though. I, I, I ain't trying to mess your money up, but, but I want to well, say won't. that, you know, I have, many, I have many properties, and I have a lot of people. I get a lot of uh, uh, notes and advertisement calls for me to want to sell my properties. Hell no. I got buildings, too. People want to buy that. No. I see, Jason, what you're saying, brother, you are a prophet. You've been you've been hitting, you've been begging on the beach for many years now. Uh, this is like a low, brother. Oh, okay. I'm glad to hear from you, brother. Thank you, Omar. Who's up next, Ramonte? Uh, line, line two, Misty. Misty, you're on with Jason Black. Good morning, Mr. Black. Good morning, Mr. Hood. How are you guys? I'm awesome. Good enough. Good. 
good. Yes, I agree totally. We are living in the times of gentrification here in apartheid Detroit and apartheid Flint. And, um, for instance, take a look at our governor, his mission to um, abolish 38 additional Detroit public schools. We already are very low in the amount of Detroit public schools that we have currently. So if you add 38 more, well, what's going to happen to um, those neighborhoods? I think that's going to be some gentrification there, don't you think? I was so upset about it. Um, I don't have young kids anymore. My, My kids are grown. They're adults. But they attended Detroit Public Schools, and Detroit Public Schools were fine. They graduated in um, 02, um, and I'm really upset about it. So what I did was I sent a letter or email to um, Rachel Maddow at MSNBC. I'm still waiting to hear from her. I'm hoping that she can um, stir up some racket and, and get this information out there about what's happening here as well as um, the situation with Flint. And um, there's another issue in Benton Harbor. I don't know if you all are aware Mm -hmm. that uh, Reverend Pinkney is still in prison there. Okay. Um, Um, Wrongfully. We we hear what you're saying. There's a lot of gentrification. Let's let's let him respond for a second. Mr. Black, uh, why don't you respond to that? And also, we've got the lines lit up, so I know I want you to stick around. Tell us where people can see your movie, where people can Uh, support you. If you want to go to our website, youwillbemoved.org. That's youwillbemoved.org. If you all have seen the nice uh, genteel billboard out there at 8 Mile and Lodge, you can see the website address out from there, too. I've heard a lot of you have been seeing that. So youwillbemoved.org. It's playing around the world, really, and we're probably going to be trying to see about expanding some dates on it. But you definitely, no matter where you are in America, because a lot of people are moving around, you want to go to our website to go see all the places that are available for that. And there's one more thing I want to, I want to piggyback off of what she just said, because what she just said was really a crucial, critical thing that she just got there. The emergency finance manager laws were brought in to be a hammer, and they've been developing over the course of many years. And then you have a governor who comes in and swings it like a sledgehammer because he doesn't care if he's a one-term governor or not. He's here to invoke change whether you like it or not. Now you have a president who has first week in office, he's driving a bulldozer over everything. Smash and grab as quickly as you can before the people you're smashing on have an opportunity to recover. Your schools, they want to decimate them. Why? You'll notice that one of the metrics is used to build prisons is taking into account how the schools in the area are doing. Testing scores will tell you where you need to build prisons at. Don't believe me. Ask the private prison companies. Ask your sheriff. He'll tell you where they see bad school scores. They start planning maybe we need to put a prison here. That's the way that that works. As far as the other issues she was talking about in Benton Harbor and places like that, you can write Rachel Maddow. She was one of the first people to talk about Benton Harbor, but her network just hired Megyn Kelly and Greta Van Susteren from the Fox News Network and booted Al Roker and Tamron Hall. So Rachel might be a nice person, but I don't have as much faith in her network that she works for and their mission going forward as I probably would have had five or seven years ago. Wait a minute, we Mr. need to start focusing on ourselves. Mr. Black, are you saying that the, the friendly black man got booted off of NBC? Sir, they gave him the Timberlands, along with Tamron. Wow. Nice but off they go, and Megyn Kelly is going to be taking over for them. Now, she could walk in stone cold drunk. She hasn't been on the network at all, but they're going to remove them who are doing well in the ratings and just give it to her. So what they're telling you is that at all levels, including your media, you are being gentrified. You will be moved. Poor Happy Al. Who's up next, Ramonte? Line 7, Shirley. Shirley, you're on with Jason Black. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve. And thank you for having this uh, this program on. Well, we had what to get it right. To me and I want, you know, Shirley, hold on one second. We, uh, Shirley, Shirley, on Shirley, Saturday. one second. Shirley, one second. Yes. We had to get it right because uh, Mr. Black's work was totally mischaracterized in the Detroit press. And so we had okay. to have him here. So go ahead with your question, Shirley. 
Well, I'm so. Well, I want to say thank you again for having it because there's a lot of people that could have done it and didn't. Um, but now I wanted to say this summer I was down to campus Marsha. I was, um, you know, going to a concert. You know, nobody. Con- and there was quite a few people down there. In fact, it was sort of packed. And up in front of me was a, a what appeared to be a white couple. And so as they walked uh, toward me, I walked toward them because I was going that opposite from where they were going, sir. So then what happened was that he he, he lunged at me like a dog would. And she uh, she pulled him back. That was the woman he was with. And he said, don't bother that. She said, don't bother that lady. This is her city. Can you imagine? I was shocked. I didn't get a chance to retort or anything to him or I, or even to say thank you for her for maybe saving my life. But I, I just want to share that because a lot of senior citizens like myself, we need to be careful because the dog is out of the doghouse. Okay. Uh, Mr. Black, do you want to talk about the whole emboldening of people? Well, across the board here, we I was talking um, on my own uh, internet radio program about there was a FedEx driver who, in full FedEx uniform, jumps up and some people are trying to burn an American flag. He takes it upon himself to get a fire extinguisher in full FedEx uniform, recorded on video, and he's basically going to play the morality police. He jumps up, grabs their flag, extinguishes it, grabs their flag, ganks it away, and runs off with it. And as I hear reportedly, FedEx said that they approved of his action. FedEx said this. So, yes, these people are very much emboldened, and I'm kind of wondering to myself, how long is it going to be before your Domino's pizza driver deputizes himself and decides that if he doesn't like your black African national flag or whatever, he's going to deputize himself to remove it? Uh, By the way, in the era of Donald Trump, would this president call you a fascist or a patriot? Mm. That's how serious it is out here right now that we've gotten to a point where if you don't think this is that serious, you think about that for just a few moments. This president said openly that after the Central Park Five was exonerated, that they shouldn't be paid anything, that they should have been given the death penalty. So even innocent, you still say that? You're just going to stick to that regardless? This isn't about their innocence. They're, They're not guilty of the crime of rape. You're guilty of the crime of unforgivable blackness, and we need to accept that there is a segment of this society that sees our removal from the American landscape as the unfinished business of slavery, and now they're here to finish the job. Okay, let's take another color. Ramonte, real quick before break. Line four, Reginald. Reginald, you're on with Jason Black. Hello, Reggie, are you on? Yeah, I'm on. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. I mean, Reggie, go ahead with Jason Black real quick. Uh, good, uh, good morning, Jason and, uh, and Mr. Hood. This is Reggie from uh, Brooklyn, New York. And I just wanted to say that in 12 more days uh, that uh, gentrification film will be shown here in Brooklyn at uh, St. Francis College, uh, downtown Vincent Avenue in Brooklyn, and Black First. Thank you. All right. That was interesting. So you're being shown all across the country. You got a caller in from... New York. How cool is that? Uh, We've got to go to break. Um, When we come back, there's more of Jason Black and Gentrified the Movie. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. We'll take your calls after the break. We're going to stretch it out all the way to our hard stop. I'm waking up with Steve Hood. No, I'm waking up with Steve Hood. Nah, girl. I'm waking up with Steve Hood. Ladies, you're confused. I'm waking up with Steve Hood, and I do it every morning. From Monroe to the Trump, it's time to wake up with Steve Hood. Good morning, I'm Tony Making with your Total Traffic Update. Right now, I-75 southbound between 12 Mile and I-94, there's slow stop-and-go traffic. I-275 northbound. After 8 Mile, there's an accident blocking the shoulder. Stop and go traffic from 6 Mile. And on I-96 eastbound between I-275 and Southfield Freeway, there's stop and go traffic. Ramonte, how's the weather? Currently in Detroit, it is 28 degrees with a high today of 34 degrees and a low tonight of 29 degrees. That weather report has been brought to you by Weather Vision. It's 8.33 and we're back. 9, 10 a.m. This Superstation, the voice of Detroit. 
Our guest is Jason Black. We're talking about the movie Gentrif- Gentrified. Give me the full title one more time, Mr. Black. That's Gentrified Ethnic Cleansing American Style. Gentrified Ethnic Cleansing American Style. Ramonte, who's on the line? Line one, Robert. Robert, you're on with Jason Black. Hey, how you guys doing this morning? Um, I, I heard a news report yesterday that really outraged me that the taxpayers of uh, Michigan are going to have to pay these gentlemen, or I ain't going to even call them gentlemen, the, uh, these guys uh, legal bills that are being indicted for uh, you know the Flint water crisis. You're talking about the emergency I mean, managers you know, in Flint, right. The, the emergency managers in Flint uh, and the other guys, uh, and, 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 and the taxpayers are on the hook for their legal bills now. Now, if I would, took a dollar uh, bag of potato chips out of the gas station, that guy will be allowed to shoot and kill me. Or, you know, if he don't do that, I'm getting thrown in jail and everything uh, legally is going to happen to me. And I will not be able to get no money from anyone for any legal services but myself. Now, it amazes me how these guys can be, have a part in poisoning an entire community and two years later still can't drink water out of their faucets. And the very people over in that community got to pay their legal bills. I mean, I think Bill Shooty ain't doing nothing but grandstanding. I mean, these people that got it hear- have already been assured that nothing is going to happen to them. Nothing I- ain't going to happen to I- them. I hear what you're saying, and- Mr. Black. You see what's going on here? These guys were allowed to poison the city, and now the city of Flint has to pay their legal fees. Oh, man, Kim Worthy might step in and defend them. She might be defense attorney for them. So <laughs> that's the way it could work here now. Look, the bottom, I mean, and understand, these are just the scapegoats, okay? This came from the top. This mm-hmm. came from the very top, and that's what we're not talking about. These are sacrificial lambs that are being tossed out there because that's their job. They're the designated victims. But your chances of convicting them are relatively low. These are just being held up so that you keep your eye off of who the real culprit is. Isn't that right, Governor Snyder? Mm. And that's the way that this works. Okay. When you don't have control of your economy, you are subjected to individuals playing blatant games right in front of your face. Ramante, who's up next? Line three, Shahid. Shahid, you're on with Jason Black. What's Abdullah? Abdullah. Abdullah. Abdullah, you're on with Jason Black. Yes, I was, thank you for taking my call, and thank you for having the great show that you have. Because uh, what the brother said to the black is show sure right, because I came here in 1950. And uh, I've seen a lot of things taking place, like Black Bottoms, all that, and how they brought the freeway through there and destroyed the black neighborhood. And during those times, we had a black, uh, even had a black hospital and uh, restaurants and drug stores and all that, and how they have just taking stuff away from us, and people from all over could see how great, this is a great city, Detroit, and they have yeah, come here because I got friends from all over the country, mm-hmm. all over the world, really. and uh, you got people here coming here from China, and they keep making money, starting their business in Korea, and well, all over, but uh, our people, the ones have been uh, destroyed, like you said earlier, what they're trying to do is uh, destroy our, our people, see, for the super rich people, see. And they're the one that's progressing all over us. We made them rich. And I hope okay. our people can see this. And I, my brother, the wise and progressive thinking brother, that the black, and you too, brother, because y'all see that hand is right on the wall. Okay. And, uh, Thank you very much. Ramante, who's up next? Sharon, line six. Sharon, you're on with Jason Black. Hello, Mr. Hood, Mr. Black. Um... My statement is, I saw it coming a long time ago, but I didn't know it would be at this magnitude with the uh, president being in the office, or so-called president being in office right now. So, with that being said, with it being so big, like they're moving us out of the country almost, what do we do? I mean, besides sit down and just lay down and take it. I've got, I'm very glad you asked that because my film deals with all this. My previous film, 7 a.m., laid out why we're the poorest people in America. They hate you because you're black, but they're able to victimize you because you're poor. That combination is deadly. Let me say that again. They hate you because you're black, but they're able to victimize you because you are poor. 
So what do you do about it? First of all, you need to understand the real reason that you got into this. In a case like Detroit, you all have had your politicians lie to you since Coleman Young. Your politicians have lied to you. They've told you that you're not a black city. They told you get along to get along. They've refused to even state that this is a black city. Eighty plus percent of the people are black, but they won't even come out and say that. If you were in a place like Yonkers, that wouldn't happen. If you were in Miami, Latinos wouldn't be so coy about it. Because you're afraid to acknowledge that, it basically leaves you in a position of saying everybody else build, but we're going to take a back seat even though we're 80% of the population. So you're invoking an apartheid system on yourselves. If you don't have the support of the government for 80% of the people, no wonder the remaining 10 or 15% can do like South Africa and bogart you on everything else. First order of business is stop being coy about that. And that's not about making anybody else unwelcome. It is about the fact that you are equally welcome as they are, and you shouldn't have to put a blanket over yourself to make someone else comfortable with your presence. And I was said before, they said, we want black folks to have a seat at the table. No, we don't want a seat at the table. We want to acknowledge that this is our table, and mm. everybody else can ask for a seat, and we can determine if you'll get a seat at our table. But when we own the table, we don't need a chair. As long as you have the idea that we need a seat at our own table, then guess what? Other people come in, and in the middle of bankruptcy, they can get $200 million to build a hockey stadium. In the middle of bankrupt, the state city's bankruptcy, they can get money given to them. Meanwhile, black people can't get pipes in Flint. Trying to make a point here to understand that. That's what happens in that situation. So what do you do about it? Priority number one is not focusing on politicians. Priority number one is not focusing on education and degrees. Priority number one is building your own economic base. You need some black Dan Gilberts. You need some black Mike Ilyiches. And you need to make it a priority that you own and control what you have because everybody else is playing the game of own and control except us. Hmm. That's the problem, and that's the solution. Okay. Let's go on to our next caller. Who's that, Ramonte? Line 9, Shahid. Shahid, you're on. We live with Solid Color, brothers. How y'all doing this morning? I'm oh, doing great. Go ahead, Shahid. Good. From um, Oakland, California, all the way to Detroit, man, they um, they pulling out this garden plot 21 with their skinheads, done put their shirts, their, their long sleeve shirts on, they done grew out their hair, and they walking right around you in Paradise Valley. Also, they got that fourth, fourth Reich moving against us, and they got the crowd control with the helicopter looking in your house with Scientology on the corner by Cobo Hall. So what I think should be done for Joe Louis Arena, since it's Joe Louis Arena, they should bring Kronk down there and also have boxing um, uh, um, boxing um, going on down there, you know, with, with um, G- MGM and all that. That'll bring a lot more stuff to the city also, but I don't see why they don't see that. But you got the white folks walking their dog through your neighborhoods and everything. I ain't saying they can't, but they got real brash attitudes. And see, when they came on me down there in the Paradise Valley, they saw not to be coming against me like that because when vans pull up and they show you don't be messing with me, you will, you will figure it out. But okay, I need Shahid. my black people to get some soul back in there. Thank, thank you, they Shahid. Soul. That's an incredible comment. You've really inflamed them, um, uh, Mr. Black. Well, I'd like to address part of something you were talking about indirectly there. Um, it's very nice for people to mention that, well, don't mess with me. If, brother, if they want to touch you, they can touch you. Anytime, any place, anywhere they want to. If they want to do that, They can do it, and there will be relatively little you can do about it. I want to ask you one simple question, Mr. Hood, and anybody else listening. I want to ask you all this question in Detroit. For the last 40 years, will someone in Detroit explain to me what has been the black agenda? There hasn't been a cohesive one. And that's the difference, because let me tell you something. The moment we had a cohesive one, there were a bunch of us that got behind Don Barden to get a casino license here. And yeah. then it was fractured off as people were bought off. Very and interesting. When you go, 
when you go down there to Greek Town, I just I thought that was an interesting dichotomy when you go down there to Greek Town. Now, for those of you who live there, you're going to understand the visualization of this a little bit better than some other people will. But when you're standing there at the end of Greek Town, looking down towards Greek Town Casino, on the right hand side of the street, you got Five Guys, Marble Slab Creamery, the parking lot for Greek Town Casino. On the left side, you got all those nice restaurants, double level with uh, non-black people, basically, as the patrons over there. I found that the black people were customers on the right-hand side of the street where Five Guys was. Not quite so many of them, nearly as much on the left-hand I side. I go to New Parthenon on the left-hand side. I, I just thought I'd say that. I've been there, my, been there myself. Nice place, okay. uh, as a matter of fact. I found that to be very interesting. So what I'm telling you is everybody else has an agenda. Our agenda got outsourced. We got it into our head that Greek Town Casino was going to be the black economic base. That, and we have to accept that Dr. Claude Anderson, who got run out of Detroit on a rail, by the way, when he said it, but Dr. Claude Anderson was right that if you, you are an obsolete labor force trying to get back our relevance as the labor force, and that's not going to work in the 21st century. They'll use you for labor to build the stadium, but the stadium is going to be built in less than a year. What's going to happen after that year? Where you, what, where's the economic base for you after that? Well, after it's built, you're gone for the next 50 years. We need an agenda is what we need, and we don't need 40 million of them either. We need all of us to be on the same page. Unfortunately, there are a lot of us, as you stated, who, because they think they can get favors from the dominant society by saying, oh, no, I'm not with those people over there, then next thing you know, they undermine us from within. So before we can get anything done, we all have to agree on what is the agenda. The agenda is black economic power. That's the agenda. That's how you stop this cycle. So it won't matter who is in office. They may hate you. They may love you, but they won't be able to hurt you anymore. Okay, let's take in a couple more calls. Line five, Barbara. Barbara, you're on with Jason Black. Yes, good morning. Hey, Mr. Black, um, you just hit on what I wanted to present because a big part of the problem in the city of Detroit is that you have black folks who have platforms and they use them to pump misinformation into the black community, you know, to support uh, those who would do us harm um, and Democrats who look, say they're Democrats, but they talk like Republicans, you know, all for 20 pieces of silver and, and, a, and a big time job or whatever they can get from this. So that's a big problem that we have right here in the city of Detroit. Uh, people working covertly and uh, it's really destroying those who would want to do something positive to change things around. Thank you. Well, let me address that because they're not working covertly. These people have been showing their colors for decades. Ain't that right, John Conyers? Ain't that right, Monica Conyers? This is not something that's been hidden. Hey, 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 Black hey, people hey, hey, now, now, I, now, 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 let's not mess with John. Uh, Why do you say John Conyers? Help me out with that one. Have, have you driven around Detroit lately? Yeah, I drive around Detroit every day. But okay. what has John, our congressman, done that has been so against us? Help us wow, out. I, Help us out. I don't, I don't think I have time to go into that during just one, one, one broad broadcast here um look i understand that folks get really protective about their political mascots i get that okay i have to take a look at results i have to take a look at that we have a situation where people don't even speak up forget about getting a law passed we had a president in office barack obama for eight years didn't even say there was a problem with police brutality at least say something you don't even have to pass a law at least say hey this is the issue. This is the problem. If nothing changes, Mr. Hood, understand this. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. I did not hear a black economic agenda out of John Conyers. I didn't hear it. I didn't see it. Maybe you saw something that I didn't in the last two decades. I didn't see a black economic agenda. And that me one, more than anybody that knows, one, that one, I will, that one, I will sit. I will grant you. Okay. But he has been one of the most steadfast politicians we've had in a in a world of unsteadfast politicians okay compa okay compared to who other black politicians because that's not comparing them to the white ones the uh, white ones are not coy at all take a look at the guy in the white house and the whole party he's with mm -hmm. they're not coy about it we mm -hmm. get a bunch of people the problem we have is that as long as we have somebody with a black face we're like well they're on they see it the way that we do we need to understand oh, no, 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 no 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 
We've no. been used as a people. No, not We've all of them. But as a people. I, I think you and I, we don't want to derail this conversation, but you and I can talk about Conyers at length. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like 100% with you on everything else you said, but you and I can have a different conversation on Conyers, and I would love to engage you on it. Um, well, I'm not putting horns on his head. What I'm saying is I, it's been inadequate at best. How, That's best I can put it at is that it's been Now, inadequate. for what we need at times, yes, inadequate. Let's take some more calls. Uh, Reggie, line eight. Reggie, you're on. Hello. Hello. Thank you for, for taking my call. Um, uh, real quick, you aren't right. You know, you aren't wrong, uh, Mr. Black, about, you know, John Conyers. He, he's been uh, sleeping on the job. Uh, his white counterpart, John Dingle, has brought his district billions of dollars over, you know, the course of his 10 years. He was there for decades. John Conyers would, you know, just look at him. You could tell they weren't doing the same type of work. Um, but my, I called because I was wondering if somebody had told you about some of the work that the War Department has been doing. Uh, the University of California, I believe it is, is partnering with a group in Detroit called We the People of Detroit. Uh, it's an organization, and they've been tracking what's been going on with the water. And uh, they have a map they laid out. Uh, you can look it up online. I think I, yeah, I saw their video on YouTube. Uh, they have a, a website. Um, but they mapped out where the foreclosures are, uh, if you look at a, a, a graph, overlaps where they've shut off water. So this form of gentrification is far more aggressive than anywhere in the nation. It's not just the fact that they're attacking residential people, but they uh, put out a uh, proposal back in, I believe it's uh, September or so, about how they, they're going to uh, put a, a, a drainage fee on commercial property. So trying to get property, it, you know, in Detroit, is, you know, might not be that hard, but they're going to assess a, a, a water fee to you. And, and he, he, you know, he postponed it to 2018 because so some people make some hoopla. But postponing it don't mean nothing. He's just delaying the, you know, the, the in, 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 inevitable, uh, the mayor that is, is that, you'll be assessed fees on your water bill that makes that property so outrageous to be able to to uh, ma- maintain and keep that you know, you'll deter anybody wanting to buy property in Detroit. So our gentrification, with the schools being closed and destabilizing communities like that and what they're doing with the water department, is our, our battles are are huge. Like, we, we got guns I, I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Let's let Mr. Uh, Black respond to that. Isn't that ironic that Detroit, a place that has now become notorious for water problems, not just in Detroit but in Flint, Detroit has become synonymous with water. Detroit plays some of the absolute highest water rates in the nation. And what is Detroit getting for it there but the ability to more easily foreclose on properties? My film also deals with the fact that you all are the epitome of what the new type, the new ultimate ideal of gentrification is. Because when I came to Detroit most recently, I had been to Philadelphia, Manhattan, uh, Los Angeles, and the gridlock on freeways. I was emotionally bracing myself for Detroit, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised at how breezily you could get through Detroit on the freeways. When I went downtown, the streets are very nice and very clean in front of the General Motors building. I was like, man, this is really nice. And the number one thing I noticed is there's not nearly as many people here as I just left in Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. And that is what is going to keep your property rates going up and up because as more affluent people move in, they'll realize that what what they would have to pay a million dollars for in New York, they'll be able to pick up for a quarter of that in Detroit with none of the congestion, all of the amenities, the river walk, everything else, all the amenities, none of the congestion. That is the ultimate ideal of gentrification in America today, emptying out the cities of the economically undesirable, replacing them with a much smaller number of people who are smaller in number but are much greater in economic value. They're emptying out your city of the economic undesirables to leave only that purest core of people who are most profitable. It's starting to look more and more like a business, isn't it? Get rid of the low-paying customers. Keep only the high ones. Good work, Mr. Snyder. Good work. Mr. Black, we're about out of time. I've got a ton more calls for you, but we have a hard stop at 8.55 our time. Uh, You've been awesome. I want you to tell people who like your perspective 
where they can read about the movie and where they can see it and all of that, please. You can go to our website, youwillbemoved.org. That's youwillbemoved.org. You can see it at the shrine up there in Detroit, and it's playing across the country. And I'm very glad I got to come to Detroit and put up the billboard. My only regret is that somebody there didn't do it before me. Yeah. Well, Mr. Black, we want you to come back maybe closer to February 18th if you're going to be here for the screening. I want you to come on in. I'll, I'll allot an extra half hour, and you and I can chop it up on John Conyers. Uh, that seemed to be a, a little bit of consternation, but I want to go back to something. I got another minute left. Our caller said something. The, the previous caller said something. The guy that was talking about water talked about the stormwater runoff fees. And let me tell you, he's right. And I've actually told the mayor to his face it's going to be the biggest business killer in Detroit. The biggest. Because nobody's prepared for that extra fee, building all that in with our high insurance rates and all of that. But the um, business won't pay it. That's the, that's the real irony of it. Just like with the stadiums, they haven't paid. Their, they're the ones who owe the most water bills, millions of dollars in debt, and they haven't paid it. So the irony is that bill, that tab is only going to be for the citizens, not for the businesses. That's the irony of it. You should, If that's true, you should see what our grocery stores are going through right now. They're freaking out over the stormwater runoff fee. It's crazy. But You will be moved. Okay. Closer to February 18th, you promise to come back? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to see you with you. Awesome, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Black. Jason Black, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Macon, flawless, flawless Tuesday. A terrific Tuesday. Flawless, flawless victory, fatality. <laughs> what is Mr. Dirk's name, Ramonte? All right, watch that. Dan Dirk. Dan Dirk. Not Jason Black. Not just, okay. <laughs> it! The floggings will begin in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Ramonte. You did well up until that. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, you all are awesome. And uh, we try and bring you every perspective. You may not agree with them all, but hey, their perspectives. Think about it. Are you afraid of the big bad wolf called uh, gentrification? <laughs>